Let me introduce Mick uh, now, who's now going to go through his experience of setting up an innovation capability and also hopefully will basically exercise that, that uh, brain muscle in there to try and get your views of how, how, how you think it also works. Mick. Grateful to be here. I got to tell you, when they asked me if I'd come and talk about my experiences building uh, and leading an innovation program in a Fortune 100, 200 company, I said I'd love to do it, but I said I'll only do it if you can make me the last speaker of the day when everybody's really, really tired. Can you pull that off? And can you, can, can you put me, can you sandwich me between the conference and a bunch of great speakers and cocktail hour? If you can do that, then, then I'll do it. So appreciate that, thank you all. Uh, of course, I'm joking, happy to be here. Uh, and they thought it would be good if, if we concluded talking about the practical experiences of launching and leading an innovation program. So in about 25 minutes, I'll cover some high points. I'll ask you a couple of questions. We could have some interaction uh, and, and some good dialogue, but we're not going to cover everything. So if you want to exchange war stories, compare bruises, uh, tattoos, uh, I'll be available after this to talk with you. OK, to start off with, sort of to level set where we're at in our evolution of, organiz of the organization in innovation. You think about it, and I've got a, an axis up here, sophistication uh, along the x-axis and value add along the y. And I'm going to talk about three uh, sort of big phases that innovation goes through in companies. And then at the end of this, I'll ask you where you think you're at in these phases, recognizing you could be between them, you could be somewhere else. And so the first phase is innovation as an event. This is sort of, and I've been through these phases. Uh, and many of you all probably have too or might be experiencing them now. This is where innovation in your company, in your organization is an event. It could be brainstorming sessions. It could be an innovation day. It could be the executives taking off to an offsite, you know, walking barefoot on hot coals and having revelations about ideas. Um, but it's an event. It's a one-time thing. You go, you do it, you feel good, uh, you, you sing the team song, but then you're back to your day-to-day -day job. And you kind of forget about innovation. And you're back in your continuous mode of doing things. And so it's a start, and it's where many of us are at, but that's, that's one of the sort of phases of innovation and organization. The second phase is innovation as a capability. This is where um, your organization has recognized the need for innovation and they may have designated a formal capability. It could be called R&D, you could have people called innovation, you could have part-time innovators, but there's a capability, you've recognized it, it's functioning, it's a place where you can go to have ideas, to share ideas, to try to launch ideas. It's a capability within the organization. It's a tool that the leaders and the employees know about and use, and it's a good thing but it's still just a capability. So with, that when the organization has ideas, they toss them over the fence to the capability and say, here you go, here's my idea. When they want things launched, give it to those guys. It's their job, it's not mine. So, so it's, a, it's, it's up to scale in terms of sophistication and value added, but it's not the nirvana. The nirvana, uh, where we all kind of want to be, is innovation as a system. And this is when, and at the round table, some of y'all were there, we were talking this yesterday. This is where innovation is systemic. It's part and parcel of the way you do business in the organization. It's the culture. It's the way you do things around there. This is when you don't really need an innovation officer. You don't need people with innovation tags because everybody's the innovation officer. Everybody wakes up in the morning, looks in the mirror like I used to and say, I can change this company. I have the control, the ability to change. They can get funding, they can form teams, they know how to get stakeholder approval, um, they can have time to work on ideas. Um, when innovation is systemic, that is when innovation really happens. And disruptive innovation, which this conference is about, needs systemic organizations, in my opinion. So those are kind of the three stages. Uh, my question for you is, where are you along the capability evolution spectrum in your organization? I'll tell you what my prediction is going to be. My prediction is we're going to be mostly between event and capability. But I could be wrong. I'll be shocked if we end up at systemic innovation. System, systemic innovation is the three M's of the world. See the results 
Um, it's about where I thought it would be, capability and event, uh, systemic one. If, if you don't mind me asking, who's the systemic person in here? Ah, Don, okay, that makes sense. Uh, who's nowhere? Anybody brave enough to tell, say who's nowhere? That's, a, that's an interesting one there. Okay, um, as you're building an innovation program, so you know where you're at. As you're building the program, you're gonna have lots of goals, lots of measures. It always came up with my innovation friends. It came up in my organization. We had umpteen million measures and goals. But really, in, with disruptive innovation, there are only two critical goals. And those goals are to launch disruptive innovations, to actually get them to the marketplace, and two, to create a mature culture of innovation. Those are them, and they're not mutually exclusive. They're dependent on each other. And so if you want to launch disruptive innovations, you're going to have to be working within that culture and influencing it. And if you, obviously, if you're creating a culture, you're going to be, need to have the disruptive innovations to launch. So there's lots of measures. There's crowdsourcing measures, participation measures, return on investment, um, customer value, et cetera, that we, number of patents, you know, ad infinitum, there are measures, but really there's only two goals that matter in my opinion, and those are the two. I'm gonna briefly talk about those. So to launch disruptive innovations, there are many processes out there, but you have to have a process. Process is a bad word sometimes with innovation, with disruptive innovators, but you gotta have a process. And that process, you know, it can be as complicated as you want. You have stage gate processes, you can have agile development. There's, there's five million kinds of processes, but they all have a front end, a middle end, sort of a middle, an incubation area, and a back end. And the front end is where most people focus their concentration. And I know there's a couple of people here that are, are you know, their, their jobs are working on the front end. But I would argue that the front end isn't where you make your money. In disruptive innovation, where you add value to the organization, is in that middle, that incubation in that back end. Why? Because the disruptive ideas are out there. They're there. Um, you could get them from your employee base, you get them from your leadership, you can get them from consultants, get them from your partners. The ideas are there. What's the hard part is, is developing those ideas, giving them an environment to nurture them so they're not killed, um, helping to foster them, giving them a place to test and learn, to pilot, because disruptive ideas, as the previous uh, John mentioned, um, they don't succeed from the start. They fail a lot, and you have to have a place to have iterations of those ideas without the organization wanting to kill them. The organization will see them as a threat because they are a threat. A disruptive idea by its nature, by the Clayton Christensen definition, is going to disrupt your business. So if you walk into the bank that has a great credit card portfolio, and you say, hey, there's, there's new forms of credit we'd like to test, they're gonna go, Wee! no way. You walk into your insurance company and you say, we want to, um, crashless cars are coming along, we wanna merge crashless cars and telematics, and we think we can get rid of our underwriting requirements. Wee! You know, they, they're gonna kick you out. They're gonna kill your disruptive ideas. You're gonna find your CFO, your general counsel, um, in meetings with baseball bats, killing your ideas to death. And so you have to have that middle place to foster those ideas to allow them to live. And uh, I learned that the hard way. First couple of years, we had 63 ideas, some of them very crazy, but they were disruptive. We charted them, we said these are very disruptive. Uh, of those 63 ideas, we launched one disruptive idea. And, and it wasn't until we learned that we had to, to uh, sort of manipulate or work within the culture. So my question for you is, at what stage does innovation in your organization fail? Incubation, interesting. And front end, really? Hmm. Okay, um, really, front end, wow. That's surprising to me. Um, you, that means that, it either means that you can't get them out of the gate in the front end, that your, your organizations are so risk averse they don't even wanna hear it, or it means that, or you're interpreting that as we're testing them in the front end and we're failing quickly. I'm not sure which. Very interesting. Um, I will tell you, incubation is critical. Okay, the other thing that you have to work on 
um, I believe, and it took a couple of years of banging my head against the wall to figure this out, was the innovation culture. Because we look at disruptive innovations, we look at ideas as seeds. And we all love to look at the seeds and talk about the ideas, and it's sexy, and it's powerful, and it's fun. That's the fun part of innovation. But the seed has to grow somewhere. You couldn't just take a seed and throw it on the ground here in this conference room and expect it to grow. It's not going to happen. A seed has to be planted in soil. It needs water. It needs sunlight. It needs air. And that thing in the organization that makes a disruptive innovation grow, it's the culture. It's the way you do things in that organization. And so you start talking about culture and people's eyes gloss over and they say, oh, yeah, I'm thinking back to, you know, my, my sociology class in college and, um, you know, norms and mores. And, or they think about that documentary of the British, you know, anthropologist who's going out and looking at the, you know, the, the tribal, the tribal uh, companions that haven't seen Western civilization in years. Sorry, Jamie, about the bad English accent. But so, so you think about that, but that's, when I refer to culture, the best definition I've heard of culture is it's the way we do things around here. It's the way your organization does things. It's how they act, how they respond, how your strategy is, how your process is, et cetera. That's the culture that you have to know about and you have to influence. And so for us, and every company's different, uh, for me at a, at, the, at a large Fortune 100, 200 company that had a PNC company, a financial advice and solutions company, and a bank, um, we worked along these four axes. Strategy. So we had to have strategic linkage. This gives you credibility and tie-in to the leadership, that strategic linkage, and it's a must. And it's not just a one-way arrow from the strategy to innovation. It's a, it's a two-way arrow from innovation to the strategy also. Because if you get the right disruptive innovations, they're going to inform your strategy. Five years ago, how many of us thought that mobile and mobile development and mobile apps uh, would be influencing strategy like it is now? It was fairly disruptive, and now it is influencing our strategy. So it's a two-way. Process is the second thing. You have to tie into the process of your organization. You have to know how the processes work. You have to um, understand that there are different places that you can input your, your ideas into the process. You want to streamline those processes, like the, the former speaker said. You need it quick. And so um, part of the culture is how your processes work. Big organizations work on process. And it's a bad word in, in you know, innovation channels, but it's a fact. Third thing is communication and recognition. Um, this is kind of self-explanatory. You want to be communicating your successes, communicating your policies, communicating the way you're working, even communicating failures. If you can have your leadership talking about people who took a chance and failed, it's, it's powerful to have the CEO or a senior leader stand up and say, I wanted to do this, we took a chance, we failed, but I want to thank the team, we learned some things from it, we're going to move forward. Very powerful to have that. Same thing with the recognition, you need to align it to fit your innovation program. You need to reward what you want to happen in the organization. And the last thing, and probably the most critical thing that we worked on was the people part. People are the ones that are going to carry innovation in your organization. They're just going to carry it. Um, so if you can find folks who care, if you can find those folks who will be champions, if you can find the leaders who are going to um, carry innovations forward, you want to pat them on the back, you want to reward them, you want to identify them. It costs nothing to give somebody a champion label, and it helps them a lot. So if you find those people that are innovation champions, make a label if you don't have one. Call them innovation champions. Uh, innovation advisors, whatever it is, um, find them and identify them and help them, reward them. So that's kind of the cultural aspect. Um, question for you, this is the last question, what's the hardest aspect of creating an innovation culture? So tell me, so what is the hardest part of creating an innovation culture, in your opinion? How about our, our systemic innovator, Don? What's the hardest part about creating an innovation culture? If, you're, if the culture doesn't support that, you take a risk, is there any, is there any real benefit to taking a risk? No, I don't, I don't think so. And that's, that's what leads me to my concluding quote here. Um, this is Machiavelli. And so if any of you uh, have read Machiavelli, 
uh, talks a little bit about change and those who bring it forth. So I know what we're doing is hard. I know what you're doing is hard. Uh, it isn't easy. And I think that uh, what you have to do is influence not only the disruptive ideas, but the culture you're working within to, to have success. So that concludes this uh, discussion. Uh, any, any questions or comments? Um, a lot of people in financial services would say that when USA came out with something innovative, the, the, the commentary that we heard often was, yeah, well, that's okay. USA can do that, but we can't because X, Y, and Z. Um, how do you respond to that charge? Well, I've got the bruises and bumps and, and you know, broken bones to say it was, it was not easy at USA either. Um, I do think that having an online-only bank, or mostly online, made us more innovative. I think having a customer base that's all over the world and having to serve them made us more innovative. But we had the same challenges that other successful companies have. We're continuing on a path. We're nine, they were 90 years old. We've done things great for a long time. Why should you change? What's the burning platform? Let's keep, let's keep doing what we're doing, guys. So I think it's the same problems that everybody has. So I, you know, you talk about doing it, pushing through things through USA and maybe having to fight the culture, et cetera. Um, but then how do you fight through technology issues, time to market issues, regulatory issues? Because we talk about, you know, a lot of what people have said today is fail early, you know, fail quick. But if you're in a, in a, in a situation in an industry where it takes so long and so much money to build anything to launch customer facing, that becomes really hard. I mean, it, it, Wells Fargo has an incubator, it has a labs now, which is which is fairly new and fairly innovative for Wells. But even still, it's hard to find, and there's still a lot of concern with launching some of that, and then even things that are successful, then taking the mass market is still two years of, of, of work, or a year and a half, or a longer. So how, how do you break through that? Well, I think, again, you know, it's the culture. But um, I'll tell you that, you know, it's like the story, the joke about the two guys running from the bear. And, they, you know, one guy asks the other, how am I going to outrun? He says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. And it's the same in financial services. Um, we're not really competing against the regulatory environment. We're competing against our competitors. The real threat is the startups in my opinion. Um, the folks who are lean and mean and are coming up with disruptive ideas and you know as a big company we're in position to see the market best like the hydraulic lifting equipment example from the previous speaker. We can see things coming. We all see changes happening. We see crashless cars and in insurance. We see you know different payment options in banking. We see that. The question is are we going to act on it? Are we able to mobilize these great Fortune 100, Fortune 500, whatever your company is, all our resources to take that on. And so it's a challenge, but, but I think that those of us in this room have to take that challenge on. So uh, thank you. I, I, it, it, for the sake of time, uh, I'll talk with anybody who has any further questions afterwards. Thank you. I have such a, an excellent uh, problem uh, in front of me. That is how to say anything additive to what we've heard today. Uh, a lot of great content, a lot of really great perspectives. Uh, I would say some, some strong leadership around innovation and financial services. I can't really close it out any better than we just did. Uh, so that's, that's a good problem. Um, the other good problem is I, I, I feel like I have it in my power, like a, maybe it's like a college professor, to release you to the cocktail hour. And that feels good. I think I'll take advantage of that power. Uh, so let's, let's not beat this up too badly. We had a, a kind of a session planned here for, for the last little bit, but I really think we've kind of said it. Um, I guess I just want to say one or two quick things um, about this. I am amazed at the collective passion of our speakers today and of our audience today and the Sellant team today. So uh, congratulations. Thank you for playing along with us. In, in kind of beating these ideas around in a meaningful way. I think we really have discovered some interesting things, and I hope you agree with that. Um, I, the other comment is, and, and some of you heard this from me a little bit um, uh, earlier today and yesterday, 
it, it's easy to get caught up in the, the potential for innovation to solve uh, kind of uh, the systemic problems of financial services. We can make ourselves financially more viable. We can compete stronger, those sorts of things. But I think there's another interesting edge here behind a lot of the comments, which is we can make the world a better place, and we can make financial services deliver on the, the, the ultimate promise to our clients for their sake, which is good, but also for our own. I mean, we can have a, a, a better time doing good stuff. Um, I think the, the, there's a lot of potential in financial services to really change, fundamentally change, not only the business models, but how we feel about them and the kind of intrinsic value that we deliver to our, our clients and society. So I guess I'd like to maybe just leave you with that challenge, uh, take some of that passion that I've heard today, bring it back to your organizations, uh, and please uh, try to make a difference. I think we all have a role, even though we, we have different roles and, and different ways to inject our voices into this conversation. I think everybody has something to say, and I encourage you to say it. And uh, I look forward to, to working with you on that. And if there's ways that Salon can help you uh, make that message part of your organization's uh, conversation, we're happy to talk about that.